wow, you're still here. Do you remember when it turned 2000 and like Microsoft kind of suggested to everyone that the world might just end? Because like what was going to happen like when all the Blackberries reset? It's basically the same though. Think about it. 2020, everyone bought up all the fucking toilet paper and the pallets of water. 2000, it's just a repeat of the same. It's like the world's going to end from a computer or from a virus. So here we are. 2021. But it's been a giant joke from the very beginning with the people that are behind the show that like this won't even come out till 2021. And now literally <laughs> it isn't out until 2021. Like this is fucking stupid. We 2020 would ourselves on our own timeline. This is why 2020 it transcends time. It's oh, yeah. continue. F fuckery lives on all planes. <laughs> now 2020 is hindsight, right? So we, we can we can re uh, we'll rebrand this whole thing. I saw we'll what you did there. <laughs> right there we go nice See? very punny super clever right yeah so anyway as the person who closed out 2020 we also have the same guest opening up our 2021 our dear friend richard shaw our favorite brit from across the pond speaking of punny he's yeah. a, he's a clever guy he, yeah he's wicked clever he's also a fantastic guitar player that plays in a band called cradle of filth that i encourage like if you're sitting around uh with your family or whatever yeah it's a good at, Holiday put on, put on some cradle of filth <laughs> and just see what grandma thinks. You know, I had never listened to their music before. And when we were going to interview him, I went and listened. I, I, I mean, it's cool. It's like so. I love it's how got you said that, that orchestral vibe. It's like what? saying, like, it, like going to Jamaica wasn't that scary walking around outside of the <laughs> resort. No, but it sounds so scary. You know, like the yeah. the, the name of the band. I was just you, they're you very these they're very visual band too. That's what that's what's so cool about them. And uh, you know, seeing seeing Richard in his stage garments except when he signed his first autograph to me because i have it on my wall i have a cradle of filth autograph and it's like a black poster all signed in black ink and the only way you can see it is if you see like the light sheens on it and then you oh can kind of see the sharpie slightly different black i'm like that's seriously the most metal thing i've ever it's seen so metal none more yeah. black none more black and <laughs> getting to be none more black and also the guy with merely a flesh wound richard shaw I have my owl mug that says, don't forget to be awesome. Uh, it looks like boobs. My little owl's are we, are back we, here. Are we ready to start? Yeah, yeah, go. Oh my God, sorry. Sorry my owls took up your time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> are you guys hearing this? Because I was supposed to say, hey, welcome to 2020. But of course, Siobhan had to make it about owls. Because all the fucking time, this fucking chick makes it about fucking owls. You want to know the, the weird thing is I actually love owls. So I don't hold it against her. But she's cuckoo. <laughs> Um, that said, welcome to 2020, where uh, we may be socially distant, but we are hopefully socially relevant. Maybe. I don't know. Probably not. Not by the time you watch this. Um, <laughs> over there is Corey Beza. Hey, yo. Who uh, talks sometimes. And then we have Siobhan <laughs> and her owls. And then coming for another round of pain, one of my favorite people on the planet, Mr. Richard Shaw of Cradle of Filth. And just all around... Jedi musician, may yes. I say. Thank you. Thank you very much. I feel so like what the fuck did I miss when, when I got 2020? I was supposedly on some email chain yeah. and he even sent me the link to this fucking thing. They're all talking. They're like texting me. Do you yeah. want to come? Fuck we're, you, we're, Corey. We're, 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 we're hoping to get away without you on this one. Right. Yeah, all right. Well, what we, we thought maybe you ditched you us for laughing. a bride. Were you laugh When I showed up, they were laughing, people. And I get really nervous because they're either making fun of me or something funny is happening. What, were you yeah. making fun of me or and something funny FOMO. happening? <laughs> yeah, FOMO. So we were kind of just touching base on, on I guess it's kind of related to uh, what happened, but the, the, the pitfalls of technology and, and the issues they can cause, like not getting CC'd on an email sometimes. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Richard, uh, why, don't you, why don't you let us know what happens when you don't get CC'd on an email? <laughs> yeah, literally my first experience of working with Cradle of Filth. I'd like, learnt the songs, I'm ready to go, I'm ready for my first rehearsal, and then I get, like, I travel across the country to get to where we're rehearsing to find out I wasn't CC'd in an email, so I turned up a day early for rehearsal. <laughs> I turn up to the studio and I'm like, where is everybody? And I'm like waiting for like an hour. Like going, oh my God. And then I phoned the management going, um, where is everybody? And they're like, what do you mean? I was like, well, I'm they here. They were all taking and pictures with fans like, okay. while you were out there trying to rehearse. 
yeah. <laughs> without you so they could post and then they'd be like, why wasn't that Richard guy there? What a dick. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but that's what genuinely happened. It turns out they just forgot to CC me on an email. So I turned up a day early. They planned like three days rehearsal. I ended up being two days rehearsal. Um, and that was my first experience. I've learned. <laughs> and now 2020 is a perfect example of now learning to double check yourself. But I learned being a wedding DJ that you always go through the details because one time I called um, a, a mother son dance and the mother was dead. <gasps> oh my God. Oh no. Except here's the thing is the groom was the one that sent me the timeline. It was one of the first weddings I ever did. And he's not, he, didn't, he forgot to write in like stepmom. mom. Uh. So it just said mom, mother son dance. Didn't say mom's dead. No memorial. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, with your Ouija boards. Maybe your astral projection skills. Can we telekinetically poltergeist in the dead, <laughs> disembodied mother of this? Oh, my God. No, but see, because <laughs> the devil is in the details. Yes. And, like, literally, uh, one time I did a wedding, and I didn't realize the guy who doing the first dance uh, had no legs. You know? And I, was like, I feel like that's a paramount thing that you should know when you're doing a dance and you're talking just, about walking out like you go to line them up and they're like he has no legs i hope these were teachable moments that's all i can say <laughs> yeah i taught them a lot about not telling me things no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, one thing, yeah one thing i learned in living in miami is that apparently well because like, i'm from michigan right so i'm like midwestern girl like everybody's on time like you show up 10 minutes early at least and here, everyone's on Miami time, which is like, if you show up on time, prepare to wait like 45 minutes before anyone else is there. It's or like Muhammad the same thing Ali with concerts. might show up. It's the same thing with concerts. It's like, everybody has to have their entourage, like, you know, the symphony. It's like, you, you can't sit until like the wife of the conductor is in her box with the entourage. And she's like busy socializing, like having cocktails while we're sitting on stage. You, like, when is the concert going to start? You play for rich people. <laughs> <laughs> All of us, I, maybe even Richard probably included for the most part. We play for plebeians and peasants. <laughs> you play for people that eat wine and cheese. Eat cheese <laughs> with wine. They, that's, eat that's, cheese, they must be super wine. rich. Yeah, 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 super rich. They eat wine. They eat wine. Isn't that just grapes? I don't know. We, we eat fucking <laughs> like hand, bologna hand sandwiches. Like well, my first my first day was star set speaking of the flip side so i flew in it was like a super early flight i flew in in the morning and luckily everybody was there but we didn't play music at all for like the first day and a half i showed up like met everyone everyone's super nice dustin's like hey nice to meet you thanks for Did coming he audit you like with scientology no he literally was like oh hey and he was clearly like really distracted like working on his computer because this is what always happens leading up to a tour it's like we're supposed to be rehearsing music which we do but so much of the time has to be dedicated to like programming all the content you know because he's got to like you know have his hands on i'll make sure it's all good so the first full day i literally was just like sitting there with my violin like looking at ron like are we gonna play any music and he's like on the computer like fixing some time code thing or something and so <laughs> just like day came and went and then no Hold music <laughs> does dustin know dmx 512 protocol because he does do DMX and I stuff. have been looking for a video uh, for like a light guy to do up lighting yeah, yeah. at see weddings Dustin, for years. Yeah, see if Dustin wants no, to do that. No, because he knows he how to do it 512 chain. So like, no, I'm, like, does, how I'm pretty an sure guy. Uh, he, he's, he's always if mentioning he wants DMX. To do weddings and make real money. Tell him he can call me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I, I don't know Tetris, dude. That's what oh he's my doing. God. So it's funny uh, that, that you bring that up. That like everyone in the band nowadays has to wear so many different hats. Like yeah. I think, I think in, in almost any band or makeup. Point, um, yes, makeup as always. But uh, we had talked a little bit before we we started recording about how now everyone has to be a recording engineer. Um, like Richard, uh, you were saying that up up until recently, you never even had to learn how to record yourself and, and nowadays like do you find yourself having to, to do stuff like that yeah it's weird like I, I i feel like i'm in that weird middle ground in terms of the, my musical generation so to speak where it's like i've got one foot in the old school and one foot <laughs> in the new school where it's like i learned to play guitar by by playing in bands and playing along to records and trying to figure stuff out by ear like because, a man. I, I think because there was no 
no, like trying to, to make guitar.com. Uh, <laughs> guitar tabs on a dial up connection just wasn't going to happen. <laughs> like, oh, you're on the phone again. I'm trying to learn this song. Like, like, <laughs> like, um, I was just trying to see tits. <laughs> you're trying to learn like the fucking solo to November Rain, and I'm just like trying to see Miss like New Hampshire. <laughs> Okay. There was a lot of uh, so with students I teach them in kind of new school. They've lost the power of using their ear because everything's kind of fed to them. They're technically astounding, but everything's kind of fed to them. But in a career sense, I was from that school where it's like, okay, I, I want to be a guitar player. I, it doesn't matter what I'm doing as a living, but as long as I play guitar, doing it, I don't care. And then over the last maybe five, six years I've noticed it shifted into I can't just be a guitar player anymore. I've got to be like a producer with like a marketing degree. Well, if you want to make <laughs> money. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't play guitar done, yeah. anymore. I've got to be like 12 different roles in order to make a living as a as a, as a guitar player. You know right. what? Actually, Jason Leckberg, who's our, our marketing guy who we're actually going to have on, um, uh, he's, he's actually the singer of a band called I'll Kill Ya. And he's, he's an amazing... Ya. I kill you. See, he's gonna fucking kill me for saying and that. That was his old band. I, I kill you. Nefarious now. Nefarious. I see. Yeah, I can't yeah. even. I can't even keep up. <laughs> um, but what he said is to me the other day was all the millionaires he knows have seven line, forms of income. You know, has seven different things going on at once, and that's the way you got to be. You got to be. A, I call myself a musical hustler. I'm not even joking. Because like even when you're talking on the phone to a client, like trying to book a wedding, like you are selling yourself, saying I would like to be a part of your day. Um, if you're trying to get someone to come down to your studio, you're saying, well, I could see your vision through. If you're trying to play guitar on a record or what, you're giving a piece of yourself. And, and the, frankly, we all agree with you and, and everyone has said it in their own form, which is we all just want to make music and get paid for it and be able to survive, which is why yeah. I'm happy to make this show. Because if I can get paid to do this, I don't even, I'll still play music just as much as I do. I just will get paid for this so that I can pretend like I'm still being paid to play music. It's also important that those seven forms of income actually pay you well. Because I have like 10 different forms of income, but it's like, <laughs> it's like selling blood on the black market, fixing, fixing lawnmowers on the side. Guys that just want to buy dime bags instead of ounces. It's like, what the fuck's wrong with you, man? You just drove all the way over here at three o'clock in the morning to buy $10 worth of weed. You want a half no, a this, fucking gram, you do this, this brings up an interesting point because this I notice this a lot, especially in the classical world. Like we go to music school and we're like, our entire careers are geared around performance. And obviously time is a limited resource, right? You know, you can only even if you gig as much as humanly possible and you get well-paying gigs, you still speaking only have so many... Speaking of, 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 of sponsorship, because time is a limited resource, <laughs> I just wanted to say that LostSymphony.com is, is providing us yeah. time for 2020. <laughs> LostSymphony.com. You were still on... Lost... Although she's trying to get her Kemper endorsement. What a fucking suck up. No, no, it's because no, I'm used to the setup that I have at Brock's apartment, but I'm in Miami right now. So like, I don't, my computer is I'm facing like a really, yeah. <laughs> no, but my That's desktop is Smith facing a really learn. bad background. Well, okay. I'll take a Kemper no, but what, okay. So what I was saying though, is like, Please. oh yeah, there we go. Kemper, Kemper, one yes, endorse us. I got Kemper. one, but my thing doesn't reach that far. It's, it's wrapped Kemper. down below. I don't have one. <laughs> Get on it, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> 20. <laughs> Sorry, oh come on, continue. No, that's okay. So, no, but what, so what I was saying is, you know, like most classical musicians, um, you know, we think about like, okay, let's try and get the best gig we can get or whatever. But so many people don't know anything about recording technology or even don't consider the concept of being a recording artist, you know, in terms of like having music that people can buy or download or stream, you know, that's a whole other form of income that a lot of people seal themselves out of by not getting into, you know, being a recording artist, even if it's just, you know, writing songs, learning to orchestrate, like somehow being involved on recordings rather than just performing all the time, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's got, it's also difficult for someone uh, in your position or other, other people that do the classical music, because it's not as easy as being a guitarist that can just get a DI and record into mm -hmm. the computer. And it's going to sound, as long as you don't really, really fuck it up, it's going to sound okay. Recording an, an acoustic instrument, especially like a classical instrument, is super hard, as you know. Uh, you oh, know, yeah. Having to, to do your remote recording for Lost Symphony. You know, there's a lot of mic placement and there's a lot of theory that goes into that. Ah, you heard mm -hmm. recording? Uh, you mean 
Shabrock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it, Brock who, right. who fixes everything. Brock's like, oh yes, I, 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 I measured between this, the three to one roll, and I would have you stand over there. And he sends us these perfectly beautiful, beautiful tracks. She didn't do anything. She just went and played. Stop no, I mean you're credit. you're right. No, I mean there, the the, the, I know the amount I'm right. of. The up, amount of upfront work, obviously, that he and anybody has to put into, like, studying the room and, all you know, the frequencies mm-hmm. and, like, the shape of the room and treating it, like, all stuff that I still don't really understand. But, there, yeah, there's a Does huge Does he understand the shape part. of you? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's, no, there's a lot that goes, I mean, there's so many things that I think it's, you know, it's important to learn over time, but it's hard because, yeah, it, you, you have to invest time in figuring these things out and getting used to recording technologies and... It's it's a whole other art. Are there any um, any talents and techniques you're trying to pick up right now, Richard, or, or ones that you want to pick up? I like to be really good at blackjack. <laughs> um, well, I, I can make a lot more money on blackjack than I can <laughs> right now if I get really good. And no, 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 no. in all seriousness, um, no, like I say, I'm recent pretty recent to self recording. I'm really getting into that, like doing a lot of guest solos for people and just really getting into it, like discovering plugins. I used to be totally like against anything digital, but now I realize the convenience of it and, yeah. and everything's Only for convenience like or, or do you actually embrace it as it's a good thing? I embrace it as a good thing because the technology's kind of, I'm never going to say it's as good as an amp. Nothing's, nothing beats real amps, but the technology is getting close to the point where it's like okay now at least we can get somewhere close do you to feel f- like it's like the the holodeck level like on star trek the next generation where like even though it's not real it feels so real like you could see it you could feel it you could touch it because that's how i feel about kemper which is like what she has down there and he mm-hmm. so like you say that that there's nothing better than a real amp and i say to you no i actually think a kemper <laughs> is better than a real amp because <laughs> it sounds like real amps but all of them together with no noise and i don't get electrocuted Actually, other than the other sure. day, actually, I did get electrocuted the other day because it was plugged in, and I, my house got hit by lightning. So I actually did. I was in the middle of a guitar solo, and I, I, I held on to my guitar. And Dan Beck, our our manager slash, we talked to him uh, the other uh, one of the previous uh, posts said that I must have a short, and I'm like pulling all my wires out. But <laughs> I love Kempers, so I disagree with you, sir. I think I th- that the amps are very minimally. I'd good. say it's a perspective thing. Uh, Because there's different qualities. I think the Kemper offers a perfect snapshot of of the amp that's sounding great. Whereas, you know, I I have I have these back here. My fifty one fifty I've had forever, and I'll never get rid of that thing. I I love my Kemper. I use it all the time. How would you? It's like six thousand pounds. You'd have to have three friends move it (laughs) out of there, dude. It's a big block. The difference between a real amp, especially a tube amp, and a Kemper is the uh, kind of tweakability tracking a cabinet with moving the mic around and getting that unique sound where I know mm-hmm. I have a, I have my, I mean the my, shitty sound that's out of phase that you have to move the well, mics yeah, later versus well, yeah, you just move it till perfect. it's not out of phase. Michael <laughs> Britt is a goddamn Pope dude. Yeah. So I don't so, know what he does, dude. I don't know what Michael Britt from Lone Star, the fucking yeah. best guitar player that like I, I've been listening. First off, I've been listening to Lone Star for years. I had no idea that that was the guy, but he's, it makes sense because what a beautiful band Lone Star is yeah. that guy. I don't know what he does. I, I talked to him briefly on the phone. He was like, Betty, you'd be so annoyed if you actually saw what I did. I'm like, probably, probably <laughs> like if you just go and put a microphone in front and say, Hey, I'm Michael Britt. And that's what it sounds like. Fuck you. Yeah. Because it's perfect. When it comes to getting tone, are you, are you like a, a tweak tweaking guy, Richard, or do you kind of like, I, are you uh, working with people? How, how, how finicky are you with tone, I guess? I've seen his pictures. I'm, I'm not that finicky, really. Enough. I think I used to be when I wasn't as good a musician. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? I don't know. Yeah. Just, yeah. Like, this will make me sound better. This will make me sound better. Well, that's why you have two metal zones plugged into each other at that time, because you're trying to hide the fact that you can't play. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what it is. He's trying to overcompensate. For the, the ideas I had in my head... I thought, well, if I get this kind of tone or if I buy this gear, then it'll open up this kind of thing. And I've got to the opposite thing where I'm like, no, it is, as cheesy as it sounds, it is a good 99% is in the fingers. Mm. And then the rest of it is, tone is important, like I'm using the gear. But I I see um, the guitar and the amp as almost like, 
I don't know, it is, it is, it is cheesy as it is, like the extension of what you already do. Sure. I, 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 I played through Brian May's rig once. Not the actual rig, not actually yeah, yeah. Brian May's <laughs> replica rig. Where yeah, yeah. Put, like whatever it is, like 12 AC30s and mm-hmm. stuff like that and a treble booster and a red special. I played through it and I was really disappointed because I sounded like me. <laughs> I, I really was hoping I was going to sound like Brian May. I was like, <laughs> now I'm going to sound like the greatest of all Dude, Paul like, Crook, no, Paul just, Crook um, from, from um, Anthrax and now plays with Meatloaf says the same story. He actually did play through Brian May's rig and he was like, it just still sounded like me. And, yeah. and I've had this argument even with some slightly famous guitar players um, that like for me, so as a guy that has 150 guitars, because I keep telling people, again, I'm buying guitars to get better. I haven't gotten any better. Um, I have uh, My search for tone, let me tell you what I've learned. So as I've gotten older, the less, the less gain, the heavier it sounds, as long as you play it tight. Two, um, it, tone is really in your fingers. So like Eddie Van Halen can pick up your shit guitar that you think is unintonated. It sounds like crap. And for some reason, it sounds awesome. Because of his yeah. fingers. His yeah. fingers are magic. And then um, the biggest conduit to that is the guitar. So like you're, you're inspired by your PRS, so the fact that you can pick it up and you can play it easily. And as long as it has a semi-fucking decent pickup, you know what I mean? Like you can squirrel out a sound. And that's 98% of it. And I'm curious. Yes. I want to hear your guys' opinion. Uh, something that's not talked about a lot, but the bridge on a guitar, I think, affects my playing more than anything else on the guitar where I rest my hand. That's why I think that I, I prefer my, my uh, like Les Paul and, and SG um, because sometimes I pick up a strat and I rest my hand on there. It stabs me because the strats <laughs> have the uh, things come up and I actually play worse on even a really nice strat than I do on a, a mid-level Les Paul. Do you guys ever find that the, just the ergonomics uh, kind of <clears throat> affect how you actually play and how your tone comes out? Definitely. I, I, I'd say so. It's got to be comfortable. Yeah. I think mean, that's the most important thing. I, I don't want to be playing a guitar and second guessing what I'm doing, if that makes mm. sense. That's why I've, I, I, I've tried so many guitars over here and I can play anything, but if I'm on stage, especially, I don't want to be overthinking what I'm doing because then it's not, um, yeah. it's just not comfortable. It's not, yeah. I, I, I it's got to be like me playing the guitar, not me thinking, all oh, right, I've got to watch out for this. I've got to mm-hmm. be two steps ahead to make sure everything feels right. And, and so it does make a big difference if you find a guitar that's comfortable. I think that's what a lot of guitar players buying all these different guitars and all this different equipment is, is almost like, like trying to whittle down what we like. So I've had so many guitars over the years that I've bought and sold in the pursuit of finding something I really like. But Siobhan, I was going to ask you about this, weirdly enough, because I've never met a violinist who has, like, 30 violins. <laughs> I was, you know, you know, you're killing my winner because I was going to tell the joke, so you should answer this question after my joke. My joke was I was going to actually answer for you. So, like, you know. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, it's like with an Amati, it's got a sweeter tone, but you got to work a little bit harder to get the tone out of it. So you have to, have, you have to understand it. Which, where is the Stradivarius? Oh, is a much more like universal instrument that you can pick up and just sounds great in every single room. But the best night with an Amati is better than any night with any Stradivarius. And if you have to play any of like the 18th, 19th century Rudolph Wurlitzer shit, um, good luck. Is that close? I'm not sure what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Amadis are incredible instruments. No, I mean, I think a lot I of it is that, that those are the only two you play. <laughs> no. So, well, okay. So yeah, violinists primarily have just one instrument because, well, for, I mean, they're really expensive if you're going to get a nice one. And also, yeah, you just t- tell our listeners so they understand, because I don't think people actually realize how expensive even an entry level professional violin is. I mean, yeah, I would say of like between me and my peers, like the range of professional level violins is like maybe like 20 to 25,000 to like 150,000. So it's so, like being an equestrian. Like you have to be bougie to be able to play violin. Well, I mean, sometimes, you know, if you're, I mean, if you're talented, a lot of a violin, do you? What? Well, I mean, some people will get loaned violins from foundations, you know, like national foundations or like arts organizations. Corey, people loan us. 
<laughs> no, but I mean, the thing is like, yeah, but, and I'm, obviously I don't know enough about guitars to say whether it's that different, but I mean, you know, when you're a violinist, you, everything has to be so incredibly like precisely practiced to your exact instrument that it would be hard to switch between, you know, especially because of like, even just the smallest difference in like the neck or something like that, like intonation, you have to practice so precisely, like to your exact instrument, like with the sound, with the bow. So, even so you're just you reiterating that the tone is in your fingers and that once you find something that is able to get it out, that oh, like, yeah, it's, it's hard to adjust. Yeah. And it's the same thing. I mean, if someone that's a truly great player, you know, plays on a, you know, let's say a shitty instrument, they're going to make it sound way better than somebody that isn't under $25,000. No, I mean, there can be $25,000 instruments that sound worse than $3,000 instruments. You know, like, for example, a lot of modern violins that are made, like they sound actually really good, you know, but it takes time for the wood to settle. And, you know, depending on who plays it, it kind of changes the sound over time. You know, because they're they're so delicate. But yeah, so it's it's yeah, it's pretty rare for people. I mean, people will have their primary instrument and then a backup instrument. But yeah, it's just you you just have to be so precise, and the way you prepare like every piece that you play is to your instrument. So it would just it would be a nightmare to switch if something were to happen to my violin in the middle of a performance. I mean, I could play someone else's violin, but it would be it would feel weird. Mm. It's really hard to switch between those. In my is, is it hard to line up with the backing track that? <laughs> Or, or. <laughs> well, no, but speaking of like play, like, so not, not to answer that question, but to go back to like tone or like using digital things on when you're recording, what's weird to me. So like talking about recording in Brock's studio, like he set up his room for mixing, you know? So for me, it seems kind of weird to play violin in like a super sound treated dry room and then to add like a virtual space on it. So even though he, we use like really great plugins and can get something that sounds cool, it's, it's weird to play to, to one space and then to turn that into a different space for me. Because yeah. so much of how I've learned to play is like, okay, you go into the hall, you practice, you get used to the acoustic, you adjust your bow stroke, you adjust, you know, all these little things to play to the room that you're in based on what your ear hears. It's totally weird to me to go and play into one room and then to have it, like have all these things applied to it later. You know, it's, it's just so odd. But you know, like Corey, that's, like Corey feeding you through a Kemper, like six months. No, later. but stuff, it's stuff like that. I mean, that's that's a little different because it's more on the electronic side. But I'm saying playing an acoustic instrument. You know, yeah. it's it's weird to play in one space and then to like well, add a, a also different a lot, space onto it. A lot it. of the sound of violin, viola, and string instruments is the room. So yeah, it is it's tricky reverb for sure. To, uh, so like like uh, you know, I would love if if every song we did, we could go to a really beautiful hall and and yeah, like a, a live put room. up a mic yeah. across the room and get that because. Uh, and we've talked about this before and, and, and no offense at all, but close mics on violins are painful. It's oh like, God, it's horrible. It's like I mean, it's like grating sound. I mean, you, and then you can get it to a point where, where it's, it's, it's usable. And as you stack them, it becomes more of a, a lush sound, but like we've learned this the hard way. Only like a thousand tracks and we figured it out. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, but this, like, when I listen to myself, if I record in a dry room with a close back, I'm yeah. like, oh God, I should, I should quit violin. Like, there's something <laughs> yeah, really you know, I wrong. Feel the same when, I, I feel the same way when I'm alone in a room <laughs> and it's dry by myself. <laughs> but yeah, even a, even a guitarist that has to listen to their DI tracks, Richard. I don't know if you mm -hmm. have experience in that. If if your engineer is editing, oh. you're like, oh God, I suck. <laughs> 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 you know, any any dry signal that that's not how the the listener hears it can be like offensive. I edit like, you know, if I'm doing some electric guitars and stacks and stuff, you know, you listen in just the DI, just what's coming direct out of the guitar. It's very clean, um, very honest. To, you know, if your pick hits at the wrong angle, you know, you can hear it. And then you slap some distortion, put it through an amp and it sounds amazing. But, but it's right. very, you feel very naked if you're hearing your guitar um, DI, just like a singer that's in the studio and, and then they take your urban compression off and you'll, they just cry and run out of the room. <laughs> 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 but it's good to practice in environments like that because then if you can make it sound really good when you hear all the shit, it's it it really you, you sound a lot well, better once you get into the real place. Richard, do you have somebody that inspires you and it doesn't necessarily need to be musical but can push you further? Because I remember watching an interview with Vladimir Horowitz, and for people that don't know who that is, he was a virtuoso pianist from like the fifties and six. And he, he just played absolutely unbelievable. And they said, well, uh, to his wife, like. Well, what do you ever say to him? She goes, oh, I tell him when he's wrong. And they're like, do you know anything about music? She goes, no, but I know when he's wrong. You know, like, and yeah. I'm wondering, do, do you have that? Like, is that, does that push you further? Because I feel like Brock isn't pushing Siobhan as far as she could. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Brock is incredibly critical. I, I, did I tell you guys this story where I was, when I ended up doing that Bach recording? Yeah, about and your like, makeup. 
no, no, he, no. He came in and he listened to it. And he's like, no, what the so fuck so is good. going on here? He's like, I can't understand anything. What is this piece? This, you, this took you all day to do this. And I'm like, I'm like, what? I was like, I thought it sounded okay. And he was just like, totally could not That's even hear it. abusive. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't trying to be mean, but like, like I've said before, he's the type of person where if something isn't like panned the right way or the tone is not right, he, his brain just shuts off. Whereas for me, like, I, I don't know, I guess I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to, about the to notes. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, it's funny because I've noticed it over time and paying attention to some of these things he points out, my ear has developed. So I'll go back and listen to like recordings or things that I used to love. And I'll go back and be like, Oh man, like this actually doesn't sound that great anymore. It's like just the playing like it, is good. Yeah, it's just like food. It's a it, presentation yeah. is as important as, as the ingredients. So if you have this, this great, you know, piece of music, but you can't hear all the details and it's not, it's only as good as what you can experience. Well, but, and it's hard to, you know, with violin music that a lot of the time it's really complicated. It's hard to like take my experience out of it and try and hear it from someone who might not know the piece or doesn't know violin because there, you know, a lot of violin music is kind of complicated. If you haven't maybe studied it, you don't like, you don't know what to listen for. for it. Yeah. No, it's just that I, I know the pieces. So when I, you know, it's like if I go see a performance of a concerto that I've studied, it means more to me because I know what it's like to learn that piece. You know what I mean? Whereas if you go and you listen to something that's, you don't have a personal relationship with it, you know, it's a little, it's a little less accessible maybe. So Richard, do you have any like relation to that? Uh, no. <laughs> I was gonna say you're getting really quiet over there. I was like, what, what am I saying? That's He's like, everything I do is gold. It's amazing. It's fine. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, yeah, everything's excellent. That comes out straight away. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Piss excellence. Now, the big reason, to be honest with you, why I practice not plugged into an app. Like to be honest with you, I I because if I could make it sound good acoustically and get a feel for it, I go, this sounds good with. No miking, no amps, no nothing. And then when I do plug it into an amp, then I know everything's going to be good. The only thing I do make sure with an, I do practice with an amp is if I've got to play something that is going to be later, quite high gain, because I want to be able mm. to make sure I've, my muting is good enough so mm. that there's no unnecessary scrapes and little noises that aren't meant to be sure. there. But as my technique as a whole, very, very, very rarely play for an amp. Yeah. I was going to ask, what are your thoughts on uh, something I mentioned to Brock when he was practicing is I wonder what about like practicing on acoustic guitar? How does that translate to playing on electric guitar plugged in? Because to me, it seemed like, like when I play on acoustic violin, I feel like that's how I develop my te technique much better. If I were to practice on electric all the time, it would probably be total shit. So oh, I wonder yeah. if that's like a useful technique for guitar players too. I, I tell a lot of my students to do that who are kind of like, they're not sure where they sound like they've been playing electric for a long time. They're thinking mm -hmm. about getting acoustic. And I do tell them it's like one of the best things you could probably do is try and do the things you're doing on electric on an acoustic and you're having like honest off representation. Your, yeah, it's an, exactly. It's an honest. Well, it's, also, it's also like if you can play it on an acoustic and you practice it on an acoustic and you go on to an electric, it should be like fucking. Exactly. Yeah. It's like swinging. That's a good to know. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Definitely. And that, it's like a booty band. You know what I mean? Well, that's good. Now you've validated my opinion, so I can go back and tell him. If you don't want to listen to me, Richard Shaw said it was good. <laughs> so I have clout now. <laughs> You'll be like, who's that? You'll be like the guitar player from, from Cradle of Phil. No, he What's knows. Mine? Of course he knows. Of course he knows. He's like constantly feeling inadequate. He's like, I can't play like these guys. <laughs> and I try to yell at him. I'm like, listen, Ron's why do you practice? Awesome, like, dude. No, Ron's he's great. He's, he's great. great. No, he's great. But it's, it's funny because I do like, uh, like I feel like. for 24 years old. <laughs> you would love to hear that. No, but I feel like a lot of things on violin, like practice techniques can really translate to guitar too. And I, it's hard for me to convince somebody that plays guitar, especially him, because I don't play guitar, you know, so I can't say like, oh, practice it this way. This is how violinists get better. But I feel like there is probably a lot of, you know, similar approaches that can translate well. Definitely. I'd agree with that. Yeah. How was his birthday, by the way? Oh, it was good. Oh, he had a, yeah, he had a great time. He's like sat and watched TV for like four hours, and then he pl played guitar for the rest of the night. And I didn't bother him. He just <laughs> that, that's an that's an ideal day for Brock. Like minimal human interaction, eating good food, and then playing guitar without being interrupted. <laughs> we went out to dinner. Yeah, it was with his family, so that was nice. He got a giant margarita, so it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Um, yeah. As far as practicing goes, uh, Richard, for for speed, for someone who's trying to build speed, what would be your 
uh, take on an approach to, to get faster as a guitarist? Maybe someone already has some of the theory down, but just wants to build their chops. Um, I found just a lot of little exercises with scales and things worked. Um, but in terms of getting the speed up, whether it's picking or legato or whatever it is, but it's anything speed related. I, the, the, the turning point for me getting faster happened when I almost went against what my teachers told me because I was kind of a, a, a school guitar player was like, no, you have to hold a pick like this for mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. proper technique and all this kind of stuff. And I remember it clearly and I was telling a student this the other day actually because we were trying to get the speed up of a certain song. And I remember trying to learn a dream theater solo when I was like 18 and I, I just, I knew the notes, I got it technically perfect, but I kept hitting a brick wall that, I can't remember the tempo of it, but something like 160 beats per minute. You mean like 2 million beats per minute because yeah. I'm John Petrucci. Yeah. You guys exactly. remember that video? Remember yeah, that video? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I remember just keep, kept hitting this brick wall and it was literally about a year I couldn't get it past 160 beats per minute. And all of a sudden I came home uh, and saw a friend of mine's band play this Dream Theater song and he played it note for note perfect up to tempo and I was like what the hell <laughs> and I looked at the way he was holding the pick and I was like that's strange and then I asked him about it and I was going on about oh I meant to do this do this and he was like yeah I don't do any of that <laughs> and, then, and, then it, and then it was this whole thing that it was like okay whatever works and what feels comfortable mm -hmm. all of a sudden I was like okay I'm going to try it slightly different what feels more comfortable to me all of a sudden literally overnight I played it like 40 beats per minute faster. That's wow. Awesome. And then another thing that I tell my students, and this, this really worked for me when I did that, so it was like, number one was like, do what's comfortable. Um, don't overthink it. We've all got different hands, different arms, different... I play with three fingers. <laughs> I play at the yeah, weirdest yeah. angle. <laughs> and if you see Marty Friedman, Marty Friedman plays almost yeah. sideways. He like digs into yeah. the strings. Like that. Like, I don't mm -hmm. even know how he... Yeah, it's ridiculous. He's, he's, he's like sweet. He's like literally like raking straight up and down. He's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. But with the speed thing, I was like, okay, now one way is play it to a metronome, play it slowly, get it accurate, get it really, really good, and like come up from the bottom. Mm -hmm. But then the other way is just go for it. And it's going to be sloppy. It's going to be awful. But you, I remember... One of my tutors saying you have to get used to the feeling of playing fast before you will play fast. Right, yeah. And that really stuck with me because I was like, okay, I'll practice something like five times slowly to a metronome, make sure it's perfect and in time, perfect intonation. That's and actually then, a really good thing because I'm going for it. And it's like, okay, now I'm going to get it accurate from, from playing it slow, but really, really good. And I'm going to get the speed. And something weirdly happened in the middle. Whereas if I practiced one or the other, I felt like I was going to be fast but sloppy if I only practiced that way, or I was going to be accurate, but I'd get to a, like a tempo brick wall where I just mm. couldn't get faster. That's so I felt like if I did it in, in bursts, like kind mm -hmm. of accurate, fast, and then just going right, just, just go for it, and then go really slow again. And mm -hmm. it kind of neatened everything up, yet I was still getting used to the feeling of playing fast. Yeah, we have a, we have a question we were going to ask you, so I'll segue into this by saying, so um, you know, we have a lot of similar influences, but you know, as far as guitar players go, Richard, who would you say was the guy that like you first saw uh, or heard on guitar that you said, "Oh my God, I want to be a lead guitar player"? Benny Goodman. <laughs> he played. Nah. Well, he he died. He played clarinet, man. So you should probably <laughs> fucking stop taking so much drugs. Um, Lay off the, the glue, the, Richard. The the, the, uh, the first association was was Brian May, and then it quickly yes. became like like Nuno and the guys Metallica and Steve Ray Vaughan and well, like Brian May is my was my favorite. First. Yeah, Brian May was the, the guy that when I was a little kid, where I was like I could hear Queen on the radio, and as soon as it was a guitar solo, apparently I was like, "What's that?" Hold on, I want to show you something really cool. And I was really little, so. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I think uh, I definitely, um, I was never big into Queen, but I was big into Brian May. You know, I, I always yeah. loved his tone. I'm such a Brian May fan that on the 19th of August, 2002, oh, God. you can see the Brian May letterhead. I have this. It says, 
to Ben Goodman, and then it's it's it goes to my manager's address. So they clearly my my label duped someone. Thank you for sending me your CD and information on Carve. Until recently, I was able to keep up and listen to anything that was sent to me, and even eventually to write back with some comments. However, I have not got to the point where, in all honesty, I don't have time to listen to all the cassettes relevant to my own work, much less other people's. So regretfully, we are returning your kit as received. I think this is a better solution than hanging on to it for ages and perhaps never getting around to dealing with it. Hope you understand, and very best of luck to the future. Cheers, Brian May. I was like, that is the most fucking awesome fuck you. I'm not even going to listen to your bullshit better ever from Brian May. So I framed it because I was like, dude, this is the most eloquent, eloquent, articulate way of saying, hey, man, I'll even pay for the postage. The same it was very nice. Poor shit back to you. Um, <laughs> but you had said Nuno Betancourt, and I, I, Corey and I actually have a mutual love for Nuno Betancourt, and he's also from like the next town over from me. I lived in Worcester, Massachusetts, and he and he lived in Hudson, Massachusetts. I said Hanson in an email because I was wicked high. He got all <laughs> fucking mad at me. He's like, "Dude, I'm not uh, Hanson. What the fuck?" I'm like, "Dude, Hudson. I I live there. I'm stupid. <laughs> I'm smoking too much weed." But what do what do you love about Nuno besides his beautiful hair and the fact he's ageless and that he's perfect? I think you've just summed it up with those things. <laughs> <laughs> but there's like, more. He's, he's just, his genetics are like my favorite genetics. <laughs> he's than anybody. Um, no, it, he just generally, it was, it, it was just one of those things where shortly after Queen, I discovered Extreme, and it was like, I don't know, it was like all my favorite bands rolled into one, and the guitar playing was just insane, for lack of a better word. It was just... He, he not only the lead playing, but he just had so much mojo in the rhythm playing, mm -hmm. and I think that's what, we, like we were saying earlier, like a lot of players were technically astounding, but they they're missing that something. Yeah. Like people talk about the X Factor, you know, mm -hmm. got the X Factor. You can tell it's, he's one of those guys. You can tell it's him from one note. And right. it's so much yeah. mm -hmm. character and soul, and you can almost hear the appreciation for his heroes in his music. It's like, sure. it, it's almost like a musical education listening to him play like you get the funk out solo or whatever you know it's like that is a crash course yeah. in that's music and art when people know? say like perfection that's uh, that's one of the solos i i like think of like there's not a, a wrong there's not a misplaced note it's it's freaking immaculate it's so, uh, so amazing i'm per I'm, I'm personal friends with paul geary which sounds like such a name drop but i just love him he's like one of my favorite people the drummer from extreme and mm -hmm. i he let me stay at his house because he's stupid and lets me stay at his house. He's like, doesn't know I'm like going through his drawers and like, there's cool shit here, man. Oh, there's a slash pick. Just kidding. Paul <laughs> knows I love him. Um, but one time I was actually going to get my stuff out of his closet that I was staying at and there was the get the funk out jacket, like the porn graffiti oh, jacket. No. So really? I literally, I call him because he was at work because again, he like somehow let me stay at his place out him being there to supervise me. I was like, hey man, <laughs> I, was going I, found, shit. <laughs> I found the extreme jacket. I don't want to be weird, but can I try it on and like take pictures? So I'm like sitting there like, ah! <laughs> so the reason I get into this whole thing is that Corey hasn't really pined about it yet, but like Corey, could you pine about our man crush? When I say our Richard and my man crush, because I wouldn't know how much you love Nuno if I didn't know you personally. I'm not much of a piner. I, I just listen to uh, pornography on repeat for like six years straight and love everything that Nuno does. <laughs> okay. So that said, one of the jokes that we had when we first started um, Lost Symphony, which was a, at one time called Symphony, um, with uh, with Ollie was Ollie and I would we'd have these long existential deep philosophical conversations about like well what if this happened and what if that happened like what if alex skolnick was never in testament but decided to play in death instead like we'd have these like weird conversations and so like we'd always go down to the battle of like well it was crossroads all over again it wasn't steve Vai, and it wasn't stevie ray vaughn then like we could have like two guys dueling it out <laughs> who would it be and for me, it was always Nuno, hometown fucking Nuno Betancourt. Like that dude throws down. He wears a fucking like uh, bird feather around his neck, so you know Siobhan's gonna love him. Like he's fucking just 
doing his hair. He's Portuguese. Like, you know, everybody in the Azores, my girlfriend's Portuguese. So, like, I feel like I should have just had it. her talk to him every time because he likes her a whole lot more than me. But um, we used to have these conversations, and I would always say, I want Nuno Betancourt. And he loved Nuno, absolutely loved Nuno. Like, oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. But I, I, I got to give it to, to, to Marty Friedman. I love I love Rust in Peace and C- C- Cacophony, like Speed Metal Symphony. Uh, I love Marty Friedman. <laughs> so the joke was always like, you know, it was the Bill and Ted problem. You know what I mean? Like, you can't make a video without Eddie Van Halen, but you can't have a video without being a band, the whole fucking Catch-22. Yes. So finally, finally after much to do, we got Marty Friedman to play on a song, and it hasn't, it's not on record yet, but we have Nuno who's agreed amidst his absolutely bananas bonkers schedule because this dude is the busiest dude <laughs> in the music industry. I'm like, is this guy really doing all this? You're like, oh my God, he really is doing all this shit. Fuck. <laughs> um, to be on a song for Ollie because it was a joke. Yeah. But we were thinking to ourselves, who do we know that loves Nuno as much as us? <laughs> and maybe Marty Friedman as much as us. And we're like, you! Would you want to play on a song for Ollie? Uh, it's not a lot, a lot of space because you know we obviously have better players than <laughs> any of us. <laughs> but um, that said, would you still like want to play with us if we could get, you know, Marty's on it? Nuno just has to decide to do it. He he said he will, but like I don't believe it in my heart until it happens because like he, it's like one of those things like if it happened. It's like, you know, it's just a joke. It's like Ed McMahon yeah. going to like mm-hmm. pop out and tell me I won something. And like <laughs> Nuno and Marty, who, by the way, when I talked to both of them, seemed to be like, not dismissive, but like almost like unaware of the other's existence, like, which is just strange to me considering <laughs> that I've always considered them to be like such kindred guitar spirits yeah, that they're, on, they're, on, they're each on the top of their own mountain. They just can't see Right, sit. yeah. <laughs> the ivory towers don't have... <laughs> glasses to one another yeah. <laughs> would you want to do that man so, so, uh, ha- hang on a second <laughs> Let me, um, so, so as in like play on a record with Marty and Nuno yeah yes <laughs> and, and maybe even there's another guy we're talking to but we won't talk about it yet because it's still like Nyeh. like Nuno is as close as we could talk about because he's like given there's been a lot of back and forth. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. Um, and I love Indeed. Nuno, but like he is um, fastidious at times, um, which is why he's fantastic and the best and his hair is so perfect. Um, <laughs> you know, like, clearly he leaves the house knowing that it takes time to make that. Um, but that said, um, yes, with Marty Friedman and with the grace of God, Nuno Betancourt and you, if you, Marty's solo is done, so I can say that's for real. (laughs) What? Oh my god! (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Nice. Cool. We we gave you one bar that starts a measure before the song starts. So I hope you can do. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, no. We put, we, put you, we put you for like two measures in between Nuno and Marty dueling. Okay. Wow. No. It just drops out. Nah. No, no, no. no I, I, I don't know. I'm just a bit overwhelmed by that. That's just. Well, it's not like more than like 40 seconds or anything. It's not I'll a tell you thing, man. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's all I'll tell you what, it, it, it's a decent amount of time and it's in 4 4. Yeah, dude, this oh, one's an easy one. Oh, this yeah. one's a fucking <laughs> easy, easy <laughs> one. Yes. All right, so, yeah, just. No, it's, this just feels really weird. <laughs> <laughs> like, they are two of my absolute heroes, so it's... There are yeah. heroes yeah, too, man. Like, listen, man. Nuno, like, we, we've we been trying to get Nuno. Like, I, I would have thought a million times over we'd have Nuno by now versus Marty, and the, the, the stars haven't aligned because of whatever the fuck. But I love Nuno, and um, we... He said, hey, man, if we can give him a few weeks, he's into it. Um, Marty has already, 
he did what exactly what we said, which is he basically deconstructed our entire song and said, <laughs> "Send us you. a new song." <laughs> yeah, send us a new song. <laughs> I got a couple <laughs> tweaks, and he rewrote us. And, and, and then we're like, "Hey, man, do you mind if we like put this together?" And we pain through it, dude, because everything he does is amazing. So it's about like reconstructing what you thought was your song back with his parts into it. And yeah. like, I think it's fucking bananas. But then he was like, oh, but it still needs a key change. <laughs> and like, and then basically I have to like ask him a bunch of times, is it okay? And then he'll tell me like, dude, don't let anyone tell you what to do. Not even me. And I'm like, but <laughs> I respect you so much. So it's so funny because it's like a lot of these guys, you meet them and you want to respect them so much, but then sometimes they're just like, well, but it really comes down to you. And Marty's one of those guys, but he doesn't mm -hmm. say that the first round. <laughs> Ask Siobhan. Like, oh, he, yeah. He, he won't even play to you a You have to go through or, several, several he rounds play, he won't through even the play spinner. To a click track. <laughs> won't even play, but that was my fault. I told you to play weird fucking harmonies when he like sent you exactly what he wanted. And I, we had no idea that like when Marty says like, hey man, interpret this. He really just means do this. <laughs> right. right. There's, there's no interpret. Yeah. You can't out Marty, Marty. No, yeah. And it's perfect anyway. To just say, but the thing yeah. is, like, Marty, just say it. Just say, hey, man, like, I came up with a better idea and here it is, period. But he's actually gotten better by it. But he has a really eloquent way of saying, like, he's, he's the guy, like, you'll set on the Mona Lisa and he's like, but why isn't she really smiling completely? <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but, and he always has something wrong with it. But here's the thing is he's always right about something. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like he, like, and, and every time we put his stuff back in, it's always better. And then like, and this is a seven minute song. It's a long one. And he ignored some parts. So we have plenty of space in this song. But um, oh, yeah. he, he restrains himself. But the end solo where it changes key is banana land. And even then it has so much feel. Because like, this is the thing I always tell people. I, I respect the Jason Richardsons of the world and the, the Mateos and all those guys, but like the guys like Marty Friedman that can just say it all in a bend. You know what I mean? Like they can say it all in a bend. Even Ingbe can still say it in a bend, even though he chooses not to. He chooses yeah. to, to be Ingbe all the time. We have a track coming up on uh, chapter three, not this one that, that Marty's on. And I think there's a section where he, he hits one note and sustains it for a good like eight eight bars a really it's, uncomfortable it's, amount of time yeah uh, no it's it's, it's awesome. the most musical single note it, it there's been you know funny all one one fret and but do you remember that kelly played over it and he's like oh but he only did one note are yeah. you guys gonna cut it out and we're like dude that was our favorite <laughs> like note. that was the that was the most amazing <laughs> note i ever heard it shows you the difference between some <laughs> guitar players because kelly's such an amazing guitar player but he'd be like oh the fat in marty's playing is not when he's doing this burning stuff everything he does is amazing so it's like you have to take out something, but like I would rather take out the burn that's like not as good as the one note that he holds out for eight bars that's like <laughs> clearly deliberate. He didn't send us eight measures of A, yeah. right? The a, a, a sharp back to A to A sharp to kind of A sharp oh, quarter it's like, tone it's like in and out of vibrato. It's it's like magic. It's like yeah, he he plays like quarter <laughs> tones in a, in, a, in, a, in a whole tone world. <laughs> I need that on a t-shirt. Right. <laughs> 2020, be 2020. yourself. 2020. 2020, yeah. <laughs> no, man. So, yeah, that's great. We, we, I, I From our sponsor, can't wait, Lost Symphony. Can't wait for you to hear the track and, and definitely can't com. wait to see what you could do. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you ever so much. Like, that's but there's other know. songs really going to determine whether we decide we want to actually make like air this episode and let anyone know that we actually asked you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so make sure that one's good first. Jesus. Oh my God. 17. <laughs> Jesus. 17. Then you get 4-4 four, four and A. It's cool. It's like, it's like a funny. reward. Then yeah, carrot. I'm yeah, I'm getting a reward because what what did I get first? Like, what was it? What was it? What was 13? 13. 13. 13. And it was a very long period of time. It was over a minute. <laughs> I have to prove my worth before I can get to 4-4. Four, four. <laughs> <Dude, listen. laughs> you told me the guitar player from Cradle of Filth would be like one of my first choices. It, no offense. I love Cradle of Filth. And I've listened to you guys ex exponentially more because of you. I'm the fan that wants a picture with you. <laughs> uh, but that said, like... There's so many guitar players I know of, like of Joe Satriani or Steve Vai or Zach Wild, and well, they won't return my calls. So, I mean, <laughs> with that said, you're certainly the next guy on that list for me. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> the funny part is, I'm actually not joking. I, I, the, we've worked with a lot of really great guitar players, and I and I give people backhanded compliments all the time. But with what people don't realize that what he did on premeditated destruction on chapter one 
we served him musical nonsense. <laughs> and by that, I mean, they, they, I call it like musical tongue twisters where like Siobhan has to go, okay, I have to write half these. Are, oh, because it's in 13, which is basically a, a, a dickhead thing to do to any musician, even in Nashville. Because it's like, <laughs> why would you do that? And the answer is because Tool. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, because we, we, that's just what we wrote, and it was weird, and Brian and I like to go, hey, how do we fuck with Kelly? That was the honest truth, was how can we fuck with Kelly? That's what, <laughs> Poor Kelly. And, and that's why we wrote in 13.8. And then Kelly was kind of like, I, I, I don't really feel like, play, I'm not inspired to play over this one. And we're like, fuck, <laughs> well, who do we give this to? And then I met Richard through our buddy Drew, and I was like, oh, I know what we're going to do to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> One day you should just send somebody like an excerpt from Stravinsky's Rite of Spring and be like, this is your jam track, please solo. <laughs> it's like every bar is. The, here's the thing is the court needs to put like a five second like thing from like the most crazy part of it so that our listeners you, actually get you that should. reference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, way, that's way too high brow for any of us, <laughs> even us. <laughs> All right, as I take notes here. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually I was trying to find a quote but I, I think it doesn't actually relate to this uh, what we were just talking about uh, so I'll, I'll leave it for next time <laughs> what because we've never been ADD on this no, show 2020 no, no, we were, us with I, your I, fucking I, I, knowledge girl I, I, no I thought about this earlier when we were talking I think I, it came to me when we were talking about like um, you know like musicians today we can like yeah like you can just go on ultimate guitar or whatever and find your guitar tabs meanwhile like back in the day you have to like listen and like learn by ear so i'm reading this book that's um it's actually really good you don't have to know a lot about classical music but it's called the rest is noise i think it's by alex ross is his name and it's basically it's like a history of 20th century music but it's really just like history through the context of music but anyway there's this composer uh schoenberg who's german um but there was this excerpt that i saved and basically it was saying you know, he had to teach himself several instruments and uh, he learned instrumental forms by subscribing to an encyclopedia and waited for the S volume to arrive before composing a sonata. So imagine back in the day you had to like subscribe to the encyclopedia and wait for it to come in the mail so that you could read what you needed to learn. <laughs> Meanwhile, now it's people like, are it's like, like it's it's not take, YouTube. I have to take my segue up both ways, uh, uphill. <laughs> 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 anyway, it would it would have worked a lot better earlier in the episode, but I thought about that right now. <laughs> that's a good one, though. Well, no, but that's crazy. That really does. You're totally right, though, and that's a really interesting theme because back in the day, and Nuno said the same thing. Like Eddie Van Halen used to play with his back to the crowd because he didn't want people stealing his finger tappity thing, his tappity mm -hmm. tapparoo that everyone did in the '80s. And then Nuno, I mean, I, I understand some of the offense that he takes as far as um, you know seeing these hyper shredders because a lot of them employ his technique and they do it even arguably cleaner and faster than he does. But it's not about being cleaner and faster. It's about the soul of what Nino Betancourt does. And the X factor that you talk about, Richard, that he has is that he can go from the super awesome rhythmic muted playing to the cleans to shred solos, to, which he'd hate me saying because he hates shredding, but to super fast, crazy runs to really melodic, held out legato all over the place. And his right hand was just as important as his left hand because he did muting things that nobody ever did. And um, now you can just go onto YouTube. You don't have to order the dictionary. Nobody even has an encyclopedia anymore because right. it's a waste of trees. You know what I mean? It's all on Google. But back then, you had to go and uh, get to the S and Sonata yeah. and the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, to yeah. know and it builds. Proper... It's got to build that like that anticipation, you know. Like I feel like there's some energy that's in that waiting period yeah. or having to go through that process that does lead like you to a somewhat different Amazon result. Prime? <laughs> <laughs> no, but if you can get, yeah, go ahead, Corey. Speaking yeah. of uh, Nuno's right hand, uh, Richard, can I can I can I submit a uh, recommendation for an underrated riff? Of, uh, okay. He man, woman hater. Wheel enough fat is on the list of. Yes, the list I'm already yes. going to. Yeah, that so. is. Probably by far my favorite riff ever written. It's it, so good. It, you know, so, and here's well, the thing is, if Nuno shits on your guitar solo, I'm just going to take a screenshot of him saying how awesome your guitar <laughs> solo playing him is and then send it back to him like, that's the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> You're a liar. Which one is it, Nuno? <laughs> <laughs> do you love well, him or do you hate him? It, you well, Andrew it's, Lloyd Webber. I posted that. I can't remember if it was you guys I was talking about this one. I posted that video of me playing a warhead solo 
which is amazing, every, by the way. A new, thank you. A, a new it's fucking amazing. It. Um, so I, I, I can't remember if it was you guys or something about that. But he commented on it saying, wow, you do that first half better than I do. I'm going to do it that way from now on. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I was like, what? And now like, <laughs> that was enough for me. I was like, he's... He's acknowledged me. That was enough. <laughs> and now you've just taken it up a notch by like saying, I'm going to plan a track with him. Well, yeah. It, it, yeah. Hopefully he goes, who the fuck is this Richard Shaw guy? Like I said, I'm just going to send him the thing. I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna, gonna to literally tag him. Like, I'm tagging you in a link that you already like. Yeah. And then he's going to be like, oh, and then he'll like you. Me, yeah. I've had him like begging for 20 years to even pay attention to me. And he's still like, I, I hit him in the face with a microphone once. Oh so like he hasn't really oh, gone oh. over it. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. And in fact, I was being a sound guy and a DJ and uh, a guitar tech, and I was doing sixteen things at once. And I was just trying to help it so he could, she could sing. But I accidentally hit those beautiful pearly whites, <laughs> and apparently he's broken them before, so he has PTSD from being hit in the face. So I said like seventy five times, "I'm sorry," and then he finally said, "Shut up, kid." Don't be sorry. It's fine. You didn't mean to do it. It's because he got so angry at me for just saying yeah. sorry. <laughs> at the end of the night, he's like, it's fine. Oh, my God. You still sound quite sorry. <laughs> I'm wicked sorry. I was a <laughs> nurse. Oh, man. Oh I, did play, I did sing Play That Funky Music with him, and I have, like, a selfie, like, video of us singing it, so it's pretty fun. That was cool. I love him. Cool. He smelled good, too. On that note, we're uh, we're coming up on it again, kids. <laughs> oh my God! So Richard, oh, you'll do this. Flies. You'll do this thing. Yeah. We can't guarantee Nuno. He has mm. said yes tentatively, but as everyone knows, Nuno is Nuno. 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 <laughs> and he's going to do whatever Nuno wants. But Marty Friedman has at least is on it. it. He's on this, and um, uh, I think Nuno is going to do it. <laughs> I think he is, and cool. and like I said, I think the fact that we can send the screenshot. He'll do it out of spite, if anything, and that's fun. that's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. All right, Richard. Oh Richard, how can uh, how can people find you? Watch your underrated riffs and uh, and get some lessons from you. Uh, it's all on my social media. I don't have a, an official website or anything, but uh, Facebook dot com forward slash Richard Shaw guitarist and Instagram dot com uh, Richard Shaw guitarist. Cool man. All right, well, dude, great as always to talk to you. Yes, and uh, thanks awesome. everyone for watching and listening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And dude, well, awesome. uh, we can't wait to hear what you do on on both songs. We'll get to you uh, soon, and we want to say thank you. And he man, woman hater, dude, get the fuck on it <laughs> and get the funk out. Twenty twenty, <laughs> extreme style. Love you, Nuno. <laughs> 